Hi again and welcome to the Talking Bass podcast. This week, Ellen is sitting down to talk bass with another bass legend and pioneer, the great Gail Ann Dorsey. Gail is most famous as bass player for the late, great David Bowie from 1995 through to his passing in 2016. She's also played with a wide variety of other bands and big name acts such as Lenny Kravitz, Tears for Fears, Brian Ferry, Gwen Stefani, Seal and many more. In this interview, Gail gives an insight into every area of her musical life and the steps that led her to such a huge gig with David Bowie. She also digs deep into her biggest musical influences and how they shaped her approach to both playing and singing. So without further ado, let's join Ellen as she sits down to talk bass with the wonderful Gail Ann Dorsey. Hi, welcome to the Talking Bass podcast. Me, your host, Ellen O'Reilly, and my amazing guest, Gail Ann Dorsey. Hello, Ellen. How's it going, Thank Gail? You for- Oh, it's going great. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, no, it's... Thank you. Thank you so much. It's an honour having you on the show. Like, I, I, actually, just before we went to press record, um, I was just talking about to Gail. And she was a massive influence on me, personally, as a female bass player, particularly a female singing bass player, because we're, we're rare. And, um, That's true. Yeah, when I was, uh, years and years ago, when I was like... In my early 20s, I was studying the wrong career. I was doing a science degree and I was in Dublin and a friend of mine was going to see Annie DeFranco. She was like, you won't believe who's sporting her, Gail Ann Dorsey, because I I didn't get my hands on any tickets to go see a play with David Bowie. I couldn't get my hands on it. Uh, Yeah, that's always a hard one. Yeah, so uh, I went. So we went to a gig and we found a tour bus and we hung around the tour bus for hours. And then you eventually came out and you were so gracious and you were so lovely. And um, you even signed your album, I Used To Be, which was your third solo album that you had out at the time. Um, mm-hmm. Here it is. Ah, oh, that's wonderful. It's a very young me. Oh, what a nice memory. Totally. And you wrote on it, yeah. to Ellen, keep playing bass, we need you. Love Gail Ann Dorsey, cherished that since that came with me when I moved to London. Wonderful. Are you 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 in London now? Is this are you? Well, right now I'm in Ireland again because COVID happened and uh, all my work vanished. So of course, yeah. yeah heading back, yeah, 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 heading back this summer though because all the shows are opening okay, and good. stuff. So that's right. Thank goodness. Absolutely. Thank goodness. So uh, yeah, sorry for that. <laughs> that's probably an embarrassing no introduction, worries. but like, <clears throat> no, it's very sweet. It's very sweet. It's nice to, to you know. There are you know, there's there's a lot more women play, since that time. You know, there are a lot more women that are starting to play bass. I keep seeing them on, on television in the states and in different places or in different bands. I'm like, oh, there's another female bass player. Oh, there's another female bass player. So yeah, you know, it's it's a good uh, it's a good thing that there's more popping up, but. I'm I'm very honored that you were that I was inspired that that I inspired you to keep playing. Yes, it is a good thing. Absolutely, because at the time there was there wasn't that many, you know, role mm-hmm. models that I could see on the television. It was all lads, 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 and then you popped yeah. up on the telly one day with David Bowie, and I was like, oh my god, who is this? who is this? That is my hero now. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. I was definitely kind of ahead of the game as far as that goes you know there there were other other uh female bass players that well there's probably the most famous one in the u.s uh was carol k mm. i don't know if you heard about carol k she was she was part of this um session players that came out of los angeles from the like kind of late 60s into the 70s she played with um she played on beach boys records and uh um, she played on Sonny and Cher records and, and a bunch of the sort of sort of 70s, late 60s, 70s pop music in the U.S. She was she was absolutely amazing. And but then she was like the only one at that time. And then there was a band I discovered recently. Well, I just discovered them recently. And Bowie, David Bowie introduced me to this band or made me aware of this band. Um, and they were an all female band called Fanny. Heard of them? They had to. I know it's not. I know it's a funny. It's a funny name for for diff, for many different reasons. But what's interesting is that right now, um, there's a documentary that has is just been released, like this week, I think it was, about this band. Um, and they they were from Northern California. They came up in the late '60s, early '70s, and two sisters, Jean and June Millington, Jean was the bass player and pretty much lead vocalist of the band. 
June was her sister who played guitar. And then there was another woman named Nikki, I always forget, Nick, Nikki Barkley on keyboards and Alice Dubur on drums. And they were just one of the most amazing bands, all female bands, way before the ones like the Runaways or the Go-Go's or the one the sort of pop bands that became really big that were all female bands. So for, for bass players out there, uh, especially female bass players, I think it would be worth checking out the work of Fanny. They did about four studio albums, may, maybe more than that, but they really had a, they were really primed for success, but it just kind of, they kind of disappeared in history. And, and like I said, Bowie was the one who introduced me to them. And, um, and I was just blown away. I was like, how did I miss that? How could anyone have missed that? So they'll, I think people are going to be hearing about it now that the film is made. I'm, I'm, I'm part of the documentary as well. Uh, Joe Elliott um, from Def Leppard is, is in it. Um, Earl Slick, guitarist from Bowie, he was married to Gene Millington, the bass player. They have two kids who are grown kids now, and also musicians. Um, it's a fascinating story, but but yeah, there weren't many that were, you know, I think of, of June Millington, Gene Millington, the bass player, and Carol Kay as the two kind of real, you know, kind of maverick players from, from back in the day. Uh, and then, you know, then, then I kind of, stumbled in there and other you know many many others there's a lot of a lot of others really michelle and Giacello, and kim clark so a lot of there were some funk players that came out of new york city in the early 80s but but yes yeah, so a female bass player was definitely very rare but getting less rare which is a good thing absolutely but you were actually i mean i mean those names i mean definitely everyone knows about carol Kay. She's an absolute legend she's up there with sure. jameson and all but like Exactly. She wasn't seen so much. That's right. That's right. So that's right. Apart from like that's the Susie thing. Quattro, but that was that's before right. my time. So when you came yeah. along, it was like for my generation, it was like you were the one that inspired. So thank you for that. You're very welcome. I think that's that's very true. That's a good point. Is that if there were some female players back in the day, they really weren't. It, you know, we. I guess the medium of music wasn't that visual in that way uh in a, in a way that it became especially in the 80s when videos became popular so you made a song and you had this video and it was you know you were on tv it was being played all over the place so it became a visual medium as well as as a, a you know, musical uh, medium but carol k was a studio player in a sense it wasn't like she toured a lot so of course you never see the people that are in, making the records you know mm. Uh, a little bit different with Fanny. They did a lot of live performances and they were on BBC, uh, Whistle Test and all those different things. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's definitely worth checking that out. Yeah, it's funny mm. you mention Fanny, though, because a friend of mine, uh, he's reading one of their books, I think. Mm -hmm. They have a book out and he was telling me all about it, like as we were climbing up, a, we were going hiking up a mountain and he was telling me the whole stuff. <laughs> so it's mad yeah. that you just mentioned that, like. Yeah, yeah, June, June, yeah. June wrote a book. Um, I think it's called something "Bridges of a Thousand Somethings and a Thousand Bridges," or I always forget the title. But it was kind of about the story of them. They were the sisters who were ba bass and guitar players. They they were Filipino American. Their parents had come. They came to America when they were very young from the Philippines. So they're kind of Asian American, and um, the other two players were. were one was from, I guess, California, the other one, Iowa, or something like that. Mm. But, um, yeah, they, they are definitely worth checking out. They were some serious musicians. The whole band was incredible, really incredible. Oh, yeah, I'll definitely check it out. Um, but I wanted to know about how it all began for you, though. Like, So, were you from a musical family? Um, not, not. Well, not really, no. I mean, my, my older brothers, I was the youngest of five kids, and um, my old, my brothers were the older. I had three older brothers and then an older sister above me, and then, then I was the surprise baby, <laughs> kind of <laughs> came along. Uh, uh, and um, my older brothers and sisters, I mean, music was just something that was a part of the household, just in terms of listening. I grew up in, in West Philadelphia in, in so. I was born in 1962, so by the time I was really kind of getting into music, which I was really like five years old, I was already like just obsessed with records, you know, just hearing music and 
singing and tape recorders and like anything that had to do with like audio, like sound and music and guitars and voices. And um, so, you know, I, I kind of inherited all of the music that my siblings were listening to, like, you know, kind of stealing their albums and putting them on the turntable. And, but there was always music at that time was such a, a big part of just the culture, not only in Philadelphia, but just everywhere in the, in the country in that sense. So um, my brother, one of my brothers, uh, it's still actually my older brother, he, he's, he was, he tried very different instruments. He played a little bit of upright bass for a while, I remember. My sister, I think, took the violin in school for a little while. Um, there were some congas around the house. You know, we used to, on the Saturdays, we, I would go out with my older siblings. We'd go to the park on a Saturday in the summer and everybody played. It was hippie days, you know, playing congas and, and shakers and, you know, everybody kind of making up songs in the park on a Saturday. Um, so it was, but my brothers always laugh. They say, you got all the talent for all of us. Like we, we might have wanted to play, but it all went to you for some reason. So it, it wasn't that I was influenced particularly by any of my other, um, any of the other people in my family to play, but I was encouraged to play by them. I wasn't maybe like they, I wasn't sort of going, oh, I'm going to play guitar like my brother or bass like my brother. Um, they dabbled anyway. They, they weren't as serious. I was, I just knew like from the time I recognized what music was and just hearing music. I knew straight away that that's what I wanted to do. I never, ever, ever had any doubt. Never, not one minute from, from the age of like four or five years old. So I was just focused on that like my whole life. I've always been like, I've got to play music because there was something about the sound of music, especially guitar. I loved guitar. That's my first instrument was before I kind of stumbled onto the bass kind of by accident. A lucky accident, <laughs> um, and I just, uh, I just wanted to be able like that, you know. It, music sp spoke to me. It was that was, you know, we were talking about language a little while before, and it's like that was language to me that I want. I had to learn how to speak mm -hmm. because it spoke to me so deeply. Like I, I was like, how can? How is it amazing that I can? sit here and listen to this record and someone's voice or the sound of a guitar string bending or the sound of a drum like can just completely you know it can bring me to tears it can make me happy it can make me feel all these things inside so i was like this is one of the most powerful languages ever and it's not and it crosses all barriers it doesn't really have a it doesn't have a, a vocabulary other than than the musician themselves learning how to speak, you know, like with, with, with whatever they, their method is of how they can communicate with their instrument or their voice. So I, I just felt like I, I, I have to be a part of that club that can speak that language. That was just, it was just no other, no other option. I just felt if I didn't do that, I would just like, I hate to be morbid, but I just felt like I would just die. Like I, just, if I can't express myself in that way. Mm -hmm. I couldn't, uh, how can I exist on the planet, you know, because it just, you know, music, still to this day, music speaks to me in that way that that no other thing can in the world. Really. Well, so that's kind of how I started and just got focused on it and was determined to figure out uh, how I could play the guitar so that I could do the same, I could speak with it. Well, you're very lucky to have fallen for it at such a young age and staying and stuck, stuck mm. to your guns. Um, so how did yeah. it, how did you discover bass? Well, I, I, I got my first guitar when I was nine and um, and I taught myself to play because I we didn't I, my father had passed away when I was six and so my mother kind of raised me it was kind of like she never remarried or anything so it was like I was like a uh, you know we didn't have a lot of extra money or anything like that to do special things so there was music in school in those days. Uh, I don't know if they still teach it anymore, but it wasn't, you know, very comprehensive. It was just a little kind of basic general music lessons. You had a music class and you learned a few scales and you sang Mary Had a Little Lamb or whatever. But uh, I, so I taught myself to play by listening to records, by just still sitting with that stereo every day. But now I had a guitar with me and I, I tried to figure out 
how to to imitate the things that I was hearing on, on the records. And, and so I had, because I couldn't afford private lessons and we just couldn't afford for me to go to a music school or anything like that. Mm. So I just, um, I just kept trying to figure it out. And I, I my first guitar was like out of tune and, um, and I didn't, um, I didn't know how to, I was afraid to turn the tuning heads because I didn't know if something would break or like I had no instructions. Like I just saw people on TV with guitars. and I was like, I wonder how these things work, but I don't want to break it. So, you know, I'll get to my bass thing in a minute, but I, I just, um, I just learned, I taught myself how to play some songs that even when the guitar was out of tune. And then I met other musicians. I started to meet the kids across the street. There was, there were two boys across the street, one who played bass and one who played drums. And we started a little band and they had a little bit more knowledge. And like each, each step along the way, when I would meet other kids my, around my age, and they were like, we went to school together, so they were kind of my age. We would, um, I'd learn something new. I'd learn a new thing. And one would teach me, oh, no, you tune the guitar. And I was like, oh, like that? Oh, I got to start all over again now because it's not the tuning that I had. And then I got to a point where I was, I had a little band and I felt like pretty confident that I was okay on the guitar. Now that I think about it, I probably was pretty, pretty shitty really <laughs> at that point on the guitar. But, but I was, you know, I was I was going for it, and then I, I, um, I wanted to get a job as a guitar player. I was 14, I would think, at that time, 14, 15. So in the summer, uh, I had my little band with the guys across the street. We used to play in school assemblies and things like that, or block parties on the street in the summer, you know. Just cover songs, stuff that was on the radio, stuff that I liked. And then I said, you know, I want to go up to the, I want to see if I can make money doing this. I wonder if I could join a band that actually makes money. So I went looking on the bulletin boards in Philadelphia in the music stores. In those days, there was a big billboard with the, the index cards. People would write, you know, keyboard player looking for a singer or whatever. You know, that's where you would advertise for a musician. But the whole board, I can, I can still see it to this day. I'd say 90% of the board said, guitar player seeks bass player or guitar player seeks drum. like everybody played the guitar so i was like well nobody i'm never going to get a job as a guitar player because everybody already is a guitar player so it seemed like everybody in the 70s played the guitar so that's how i got to the bass i said well you know what i've fumbled i had played around on the bass a little bit because the the guy that uh one of the boys i had a with the little band with from across the street we used to rehearse in my mother's basement so they would leave their stuff there sometimes and when they'd go home I'd go down in the basement and I'd play around on the bass a little bit and play around on the drums a little bit and so I got a little bit comfortable on all of those instruments but you know I wouldn't say I'm a drummer or anything so I, I said you know the bass is not that hard it's only four strings it's actually easier because I don't have to worry about all the chords and the barring chords and it's easier on my hands and it's one note at a time. I mean, how difficult can it be? You know, maybe I'll get a job as a bass player. So I took one of the phone numbers off the board that was a number that was closest to my area because I'm a kid, you know, I don't know where, who, who's going to, you know, where I'm going. And my, my, I said to my mother, I said, I really want to go on this audition because I don't want to work in the, in the flipping burgers in the summer. You know, I want to, play music and see if I can actually make money. And this band, this ad was for, uh, had summer work, top 40. Um, they were going to be doing, you know, uh, sweet 16 parties or weddings or whatever, you know, whatever they, they was, they had work booked. This guy had work booked for his band. So I, um, I, I said to my mother, if I get, if I borrow a bass and I go to the audition, if I get the job, will you get me a bass? And she said, okay, if you get me, because I'm sure she didn't think I was going to get the job. And I went and borrowed my, my older sister's best friend's boyfriend had a Rickenbacker bass. I knew he played, uh, he played bass. So I, I asked if I could borrow his bass to go to this audition. And I did. And I went and my, my, my best friend's sister, my sister's best friend went with me because, you know, I'm a kid. We, we don't know where we're going. I'm going to a stranger's house, you know, just being careful. And we arrived there and um, 
first the guy, the guitarist who became a lifelong friend, which is so amazing, the person who hired me for that gig. I, I Unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago, but I've kn I knew him my entire life from that day on. And he was a great teacher to me. He was a great guitar player, really, really good. And he really took me to another level, not only on guitar, but also on the bass. And um, so that's kind of how I got started. He, I got the job. I, I auditioned and he said, yeah, you, you got the job. And I, I had to sing as well. So we were doing like Boston, More Than a Feeling, or uh, all these, I'm trying to think of the songs that were, you know, Rolling Stones. It was all the things that were top 40 at that time. Great songs. Every song was like, a really cool song. So that's how I started on the bass. And I still wasn't serious about thinking I'm going to be a bass player. Like I, this was just like a cool thing that happened. And, uh, and then I got a bass. My mother got me a bass, an Epiphone bass, which I don't have anymore. I wish I did. I have pictures of myself with it, but I, I gave it away when I went to college and just sort of thought I would never, wasn't going to bother with it anymore. Um, but I kept, I kept playing, um, uh, eventually I, I picked it up again. I played all that summer with it and then I kind of got back into guitar and then I picked it up again I guess so I was about 15 then when I when I left college which I dropped out of college I didn't I went to film school because I thought I was going to make films um, and then I really missed music God did I miss music in that that sort of one year of school and I thought nah this is not the career for me I, I love cinema but it, it doesn't feed me in the same way that music does. So I, I just decided to drop out of school, go back to music, but, but then still focusing on being a guitar player and writing songs. But I also had a bass, which I used to write songs with. And then the more I, I kind of combined the two, the more I kind of started to get into the bass, the more I felt like I was getting better as a bass player than I was as a guitar player. And I feel like there was something natural about the bass that I, you know, it, it didn't present itself to me at all when I was young as an obvious instrument that, that I would enjoy playing. But as I started using it for making demos and, 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 and writing with it, I just thought, wow, oh, this bass is pretty cool. You know, there's, it's not, it's not what I think people have an impression of or they did. I don't know if, if it has a new, I don't know if people kind of relate to the bass differently now because music has changed and gone through so many different um, evolutions and things, of sounds and sonically. But at the time, the bass was always like this thing, you know, people used to say, I can't, I can't hear the bass, you know, like it's the bass is the thing back there, you know, it's like it's not as important as the guitar or the keyboards or the voice, the things that you can, you can pinpoint very, very clearly. But what I started to discover with the bass is that it had many, it, it, well, number one, you definitely can hear it. And if you can't hear it, you certainly can feel it. And you, and it actually, I started to realize what a big kind of responsibility the bass is in, 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 a, in an ensemble. Um, the more I played it and the more I started to play it with other people, instead of just writing with it on my little four track demos or whatever, the more I started to think, wow, this instrument is very, um, very strong and very important and if you're going to play it you kind of have to realize the, the gravity of it in terms of sonically how much space it takes up in a track like how like what what how much sonic ground it covers and also like the the hardest part was you know at starting out and I still do it I mean I still make mistakes I think most people do at some point but you know, the, I remember the horrif horrifying feeling of making my first mistakes in a band on the bass when you kind of go to the wrong note or you just get lost and the whole, it feels like the whole world has just collapsed and crumbled under your feet. <laughs> and it's not the same with other instruments when that happens. Not exactly, you know, yeah, maybe the drums could be a little disturbing if they get off the rhythm or something, but there's nothing like the bass making a faux pas, like kind of dropping out or, or missing the note or playing the wrong note or the wrong rhythm or pattern. It just makes everything. And then I realized, wow, this is, this is the instrument that when it is in, 
whether it's the left hand of the organ or like whatever whatever instrument is playing the bass part, it is the mo it is the the instrument that is is in control of the piece. It's driving the piece. It's like it's it's driving the piece at every at every turn, and everything else is sitting in the car, and the bass is got the wheel. You know what I mean? It's like it's kind of taking it because it, it's just. Even though people think they can't hear it, they don't have. A lot of people have no idea. I think, in general, that, that the bass is a very, very powerful instrument yeah. in that in that sense. And um, so, you know, whenever I have a chance to speak to young bass players or or people who are just starting with bass, um, it's just something to to bear in mind um, that it's a big responsibility. But but what fun it is as well, like to be able to kind of feel like you have the power to kind of really move the piece and also to the power to ground a piece of music, like to, to make the whole song or whatever piece of music you're playing, just to, you know, you're the one that it's, it's all resting on your shoulders. It's kind of a nice feeling, you know, when, especially when it's working, you know, <laughs> when it's all, when it's all grooving and it's all, all the parts are in the right place and you get all the right notes. There's nothing like it. It's very exhilarating. So like it took years, but I learned to love the bass in that way. It's like, wow, this is such a powerful instrument and I have such respect for it, you know, that I hadn't, I didn't when I was younger. It was just a thing, you know, it's just a thing that, I wanted to get some work, so I picked the thing. That, you know, I chose the bass. I've I've heard that story from many bass players too. Anyway, mm -hmm. that that they often fell into it because nobody wanted to play the bass for some strange reason. I think everybody wants to play it now. <laughs> <laughs> They're starting to catch on to how cool it really, really is. That's know. it. I remember my dad because I, I started as well on guitar, and my brother, mm -hmm. my big brother, was delighted because he played guitar, and he was like, "Oh, brilliant!" He was give me all this music and all it and and I went through so many different phases with different instruments that I was like dad I want this and he'd be like oh god what what, what is it now and then uh, <laughs> one day I say dad I want to play bass and he turned around and he go and he was a musician too and he turns around and he goes awesome. good you'll never be out of work <laughs> see exactly exactly that's what they say yeah. well apart from the virus <laughs> well yeah apart from the virus probably the only thing that's really kind of uh shut everybody down really but uh you're very true very true bass players I, I think that and i didn't even think of it in those terms but it i i, I have to say you know it's I've, I've had a very fortunate career as a bass player and 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 it's always you know everybody always needs a bass player it's like mm -hmm. it's definitely uh not a bad instrument to choose if you want to keep working as a musician absolutely but especially a singing bass player and and one there of you your go. caliber especially because you are phenomenal you know thank you so much thank but, you but but as you were saying earlier on you I, it wasn't like you were playing bass and then you were forced to sing or singing came later because it was required you've always been a singer always been a singer yeah i mean i wanted the even before i got my guitar my first guitar on my ninth birthday my my uh my musical brother rashad he 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 um he i remember he had a little reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder we had in those days with the little microphone attached and and you know i don't even know we probably had like two little reels of tape that we taped over and over and over little new things but the, i remember the first time he said you can sing in this like and you know i play it back and it'll be like on the radio you know and i was singing sitting on the dock of the bay or just reading i can so remember and the first time i sang that in my little five-year-old voice or whatever and it came back on the tape i was like Again, I was hooked. I was like, oh, I got to do this. I got to make records and I want to play guitar. And I went like, what? Wow. So I would play it over and over again until the tape broke, you know, of course. <laughs> so I always sang, you know, I didn't sing in church or anything. Everybody always thinks, oh, you know, coming from a black American sort of background, it's like it's gospel or whatever. And But I'm not that kind of singer anyway. I'm not really a gospel singer or like, I wouldn't even consider myself like a soul singer. Because the singing that I really loved that inspired me at that time was stuff like Carole King and Roberta Flack and Dionne Warwick and Karen Carpenter and uh, Olivia Newton-John and Carly Simon. Like those were the, the, the sort of 70s vocal, vocal music they used to call Helen Reddy, 
you, that's what my mother had on the AM radio station in the morning, you know, when I was getting my, having my breakfast for school. And those were the voices that I really, really loved, that kind of singing. And I think that I, I'm more influenced by that and that my voice is more in that realm than, than you know, singing at church, you know, because we did go to church. I was raised Baptist, but I, I wasn't in the choir or anything. Yeah, when you mentioned those yeah. influences there vocally, you can you can hear those in your voice. Like definitely, you've got like the warmth of Karen Carpenter, but you've got like the power of another band you love a lot, Heart. Heart. Yeah. Well, see, they were my that that you know, even though they they weren't bass players, but that Nancy Wilson was my my first like like you know, kind of took me to that next level of confidence because. At this point, well, Heart came out, I would think, in 1975-ish, so that would make me about 12, 13. And I was already playing guitar, but it was all about, you know, Mark Farner from Grand Funk Railroad and Terry, uh, Terry Kath from Chicago, Eric Clapton, like, these were my guitar, like, heroes, you know. And then, and some of the pickers, like Jim Croce and stuff, the guitar, like, sort of acoustic guitar stuff. And then Hart came, and I was like, oh, "There's Nancy Wilson with a SG, you know, and she's rocking out." And this is the it's their band with the guys. It wasn't like it was the a boys band that had two girls playing. It was like this, the Wilson sisters and their their guys. And that's when and when I saw Nancy Wilson up there playing Barracuda, I was like. And and also Anne singing her ass off. I mean, to me, the greatest female rock singer. Oh, ever. I totally to agree. Day. Totally. I, I don't. You know. I mean, that I don't. That I can't. She has no peers in my, in my opinion. But she had that voice that could cut with the guitars and just do like whatever when it came to rock music. And that's not easy for a female voice. But um, Nancy Wilson was definitely both of them because Anne played a little guitar as well. That was when I said. I know I can, I, I can do this. It's possible. It's possible that I could keep going and have a career and play like whatever I want on the guitar, not just like strumming like a, you know, folk music or whatever. I can, I can strap on a Les Paul if I want, because Nancy's, you know what I mean? I can, you know, I can really like go for it. And, and I think I really kind of did for a while, especially with my early records, um, when I first got my record deals and stuff in London, a lot of what I was doing was a m lot more kind of rock based and kind of a little harder and because I was really kind of stoked by that, I think, still from my from my teenage years. And I've mellowed out a little bit now, but I still, you know, still love a little rock guitar every now and then. <laughs> you gotta you gotta rock out, you know, get that feel that power, feel that rush. Yeah. But yeah, heart. They were they were my a huge, huge inspiration for me. And I, I'm grateful to them. I've got to meet them and tell them that, which is really exciting for me. And I, and I, I, I saw them many times uh, in concert and I broke into their dressing room when I was 14 and I have an autograph from them, which I have on my wall at home in New York. And when I got to meet, to f officially meet them in like 2000, it was like around 2000, I think, um, I had set up a meeting to go one of their shows and see them before the show. And I took this little piece of paper autograph that I had from when I was 14 in 1977. So do you remember this little kid who broke into the dressing room of the Tower Theater? And, and they, they say they remember, but I know they don't because I know how it is. You, they do so many shows, you don't remember these things. Maybe sometimes you do. Yeah, well, you remembered me so, today. Yes, I did. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> So that was really, um, yeah, they were really a big influence, and I still, I still feel that they're just incredible musicians, both of them and Nancy, incredible musicians. Did you ever get a chance to play with them? No, 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 not yet. I was actually, I was. Um, there was a possibility I was going to connect actually last year uh, in lockdown time with with Anne. She was doing some solo stuff, and um, I had. Um, my connection to them, funny enough, is that uh, for the last um, Bowie tours, the last the reality tour, and even I had I had Nancy Wilson's guitar tech was my bass tech wow. on those tours because they weren't working at the time. And uh, Jeff Ousley is his name, and Jeff Jeff still works for for Anne, and uh, I'm not sure. If, yeah, I think he's working with Anne now. 
uh, exclusively at the moment. Um, and he, he sent me an email and he said, you know, Anne's doing some some solo stuff and maybe you guys should hook up. And, and so we kind of, I got, he, get, he kind of did an email thing, but neither of us kind of, it was such a weird year last year. It was kind of like, you know, we never kind of followed up on it, but maybe, maybe in the future I might get to do something with Anne. It'd be great. Yeah. I know Nancy, I only just found out last week, Nancy Wilson just put out a solo album. So wow. I just put it up on my Spotify. Yeah. Oh. She's done her first solo album. That's great. I think the ultimate gig would be um, you, Sheila E and Anne and Nancy. Oh yeah. That'd be pretty amazing. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. That would be great. I would love that. You can just put, you can, when this podcast comes out, you can just send it to them. Just start planting the seed there, you know. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Exactly. As long as I get tickets to the gig, I'm happy. There you go. You got it. <laughs> um, right. So well, who were your, once you started playing bass then, once you fell in love with the instrument and you realized, yes, I've got the power. Um, mm-hmm. were there, did you get turned on to other bass players then? Did you find any influences there? Um, I didn't really start thinking about, like, really, really paying attention, I think, to a lot of other bass players until I started to work more professionally as a bass player, because what was happening was I was doing more touring, which I've always done for my career. I'm not, I've done, a, you know, a fair amount of records, but I'm not really one of those session people. I'm not on, like, records all the time. I'm not playing on everybody's record, but I did a lot of different tours where I had to learn bass players' parts, other bass players' parts, very famous bass players, in fact, from Tony Levin to Pino Palladino to, like, all the, the big guys are, you have been on a lot of the records that I have had to reproduce live. So, in learn and, and really that, you know, it was kind of like my... My work was really what I did as a kid, just learning music, was putting on a record and learning the part by hearing the the record, because I still don't read music and I still don't uh, know theory and stuff very well. I mean, I've picked up a few things as the years have gone by, but I'm really not technically trained in that way at all. So I'm still working with my ears. And when I started to hear, when I started to have to learn bass players, especially for, say, like Bowie, you go through decades of songs where he's had five or six different bass players on different eras of his career, and they all have a different style and a different way they approach the songs. So then I started to become aware of other bass players in that way, because I was like, how do they think? Oh, wow, look, I would never have done a fill there. Or, you know, just sort of thinking about how they put together and structured their bass parts on these records, and um, and then trying to find my own sound, like how I, how I would how how would I do it, you know? Some and some artists, um, some artists were well. That's I think that was the beauty of working with David Bowie of 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 all the artists I think I've worked with, is there was an immense amount of freedom and encouragement to explore your instrument, whatever you did, you know, whatever you know, whatever he would be like try whatever you know he he never would say unless he knew he would know if he had a specific idea he would tell you what it was but most of the time you came in and you had a chance to kind of find something try something different because he didn't always want to repeat his songs live exactly the way they were on the record Mm -hmm. some artists are the other way around they want it to sound just like the record they want it to be more pop and more you know, they want the fills and things in the same place and they want everything to, you know. So um, with, you know, learning learning other bass players' parts um, and then trying to find my own voice was became, an, you know, that's kind of when I started to really be aware of, of, of other bass players, I should say, is, is that I had to learn what they were doing and, and, and think about why they were doing it and, which things I liked and which things I didn't like, like, like the choices I would make or, or, or not make mm. if I were playing that same song. Um, and then I, so I would say, you know, actually funny enough, when I first uh, came to London in the early 80s, I got into jazz bass players more. I started listening to uh, Ron Carter and Charles Mingus is like my favorite bass player in the whole world. Even though I don't play jazz, I just think, 
that man embodies the bay. Like he is, he's physically a bass almost. Like he's like, it's like he, when I listen to how he plays and how he composes on the bass, it's just so, it's kind of the most, some of the most powerful bass playing I have ever, for me, I've ever experienced. And um, so then I was listening to a lot of kind of jazz players, um, Scott Lafaro and stuff, I kind of got into that. And then um, I guess my other favorite bass players were always the ones that played on kind of the Carol Kay era. There's a bass player named Joe Osborne, who was also part of that team of the Wrecking Crew that Carol Kay was a part of. And he played on the Partridge Family stuff and, um, um, oh my gosh, America. Uh, oh gosh, I can't even, he's on so many things. Barbara Streisand, I mean, he's just one of those guys that's just on there. The Carpenters, he played on a lot of that stuff. I really like that kind of bass playing. I like the melodic bass playing. You know, like I, um, I, I played funk because it was something that, you know, I kind of covered most of the genres on the bass because to work you do, you know, you learn that, you know, you get a job and you, maybe it's not your specialty, but if you can get through the parts and, and make it, you know, um, uh, you know, believable or whatever, um, it works. And it's, and to me, it's always a learning experience. It's fun. It's fun to try anything from reggae to funk to jazz to whatever. But my preference of bass playing is definitely that more melodic, um, musical kind of playing. Um, um, so my favorite bass players are like Joe Osborne, Carol Kay, Nathan East, who produced my first solo album, um, Tony Levin, um, Pino Palladino, uh, the kind of players that have this kind of, they're not, you know, you know that they're like, they're technically probably miles ahead of where I'll ever be, but they, but musically, like, they just do all the right tasty parts on the bass. And and again, going back to realizing the responsibility of the bass player, you know, if you're too busy or you're not, you know, aware of the music that's around you and how you need to fit in that so that you, you do your job to support it, but not overwhelm it. And then, and also realizing the moments when you can step out and do your nice fill or, or, or decide, oh, well, you know, I'm going to make this halftime. I'm going to, you know, you can really, really play with the structure of the song. Those players that, that are masters at that became like my favorite players. And those, you know, Leland Scalar, uh, Joe Osborne, Nathan, those guys to me are just, you know, beautiful players. And Carol Kay, I would add her in that because she's kind of in that genre of music. Um, that I really, really love. That, that at first kind of informed my, my kind of my childhood love of AM radio. <laughs> and what about John Deacon? Because you're you're playing John as well, of course. I he's like you know, Queen, of course, my favorite band of all time. John Deacon is exceptional, and and you know, he he's one of the most underrated bass players, I think in the history of music. Totally. Maybe because he maybe because he kind of disappeared. I don't know if, you know, he, he kind of opted out of everything um, for whatever reasons. I have no idea. I, I don't really know um, why. But he is just, you know, queen in general. Like, I, I suppose I don't always bring him up right away because I think of them as a unit. You know, like I always forget them. And I think of those four guys, the original four members of Queen, as this incredible unit that without the four, it's not really the same. Not to say <clears throat> they're not still doing good music now or play, you know, playing as well as they did or whatever, but the, the four of them together created something that I don't think I've ever, ever seen ever they they're the most amazing live band i've ever seen to this day mm. even even more than anything i've ever been a part of i i have never seen anything more exhilarating and amazing than seeing them live in the 70s in their at that peak i saw the the night of the opera tour the day of the races news of the world jazz i saw all those tours wow. 
as a teenager, and I was blown away. I, I, I mean, four little guys made the most massive sound. And John's playing is just, I, when I go and listen to the records now, you know, and it's things like Millionaire Waltz and stuff, it's, it's you know, and Killer Queen. I mean, he, he was like classical on the bass. He, you know, John Entwistle was a little bit the same, but not quite as refined as John Deacon, you know? John, uh, John, he was a bit more gritty, but he had all that kind of Bach kind of stuff going on, like sort of classical kind of, you know, stuff. But the beautiful riffs and things that John Deacon would play under that music. And, and you would listen, I would listen to him and I would think, why does this work? How can, how does it even work with this guitar that Brian May's doing? He's got all this overdub stuff and then you've got Roger Taylor, who is not the, like the most tightest drummer in the world. He's kind of got this loose thing going on that's kind of wild and kind of rough around the edges. And then you have Freddie with this sort of classical piano and this, vo this voice. I mean, everything about that band is so unique. And no one has ever come anywhere close to it, in my opinion. They, they, some people have no peers. They have no peers, you know. Joni Mitchell's another one. There's no one in that, you know. Mm. They don't have anyone that's kind of like a little band of bands that were just like that or just like that. You know, a lot of, a lot of groups have kind of a few groups that sound just like them or were inspired. But Queen would just, et cetera. And John Deacon is just an extraordinary bass player. And I, and I should be much more recognized, you know. It's funny, my, my, one of my best friends sent me a text um, like about a month ago. I hadn't talked to her. It was just a childhood friend who knew me in high school and everything. And she said she was in, um, she was a, uh, she was in the Target, like it's just like a little uh, shopping, net, like a, uh, like a, Kind of a Marks and Sparks of America, what I don't know what you call it. It's kind of an everything kind of store. Mm -hmm. They sell records, they sell clothes, they sell food. And she said she, there was a young, a young, a very young boy in front of her in the queue, and he was buying the Queen Two album. Oh my God! He was actually buying a CD or whatever. And right away she texted me. She said, "I'm in line at the Target." And there's a kid buying a Queen 2 album. I had to just write to you because it made her think of me because she knew what a Queen freak I was as a kid. Yeah. And I was thinking, you know, I hope that a lot of kids do go back and discover that music yeah. um, just in terms of, being, of the, the originality, the creativity that's going on in that music is exceptional. Mm. And, and they were breaking breaking boundaries and breaking and a lot of artists were at that time and I feel like now a lot of things are not bold enough you know and there's a lot of stuff that just sounds the same and everybody goes for the same thing and I and I and I you know I you know I hate to say it but I, I blame the computer for that a little bit <laughs> <laughs> because well I do because it's like you can do just before I've started here with you I was working on some some new material and I'm I'm messing around with plugins and loops of the, you know, I'm like, what am I doing? I need to pick up the instrument. You know, it's like, you, it's so easy to get down that rabbit hole of, of sounds that are already created for you and things you can fix and everything is so like, and then they all, it all ends up sounding the same because it's coming from the same sources that we've created. Whereas, you know, Brian May made a guitar out of the firewood of his uh, father's old uh, fireplace or something, you know, um, and then, you know, when I was a kid, we would, I had friends who would go to the Radio Shack, which was like an electronic shop we used to have in America, it doesn't exist anymore, where you could buy all the little electronic parts and they would, we'd make our own pedals. You know, we'd make something that would, you know, and find all these cables and solder them together and try, like the, like kind of the lack of, of, um, resources that that now we have a, in abundance on the internet on on our computers that we can just make something virtually happen in, instantly or buy it or, or or download it it's like it takes away that kind of um energy that comes from being from comes from our imaginations and i hope that when kids rediscover queen or the, maybe that kid was a bass player maybe he's into guitar maybe he sings who knows but if to to hear, I hope that they can take from that music 
the incredible amount of imagination that went into that and personality that went into it and fearlessness that went into mm. it. I mean, I, I've seen the film now with, with Bohemian Rhapsody, so I, I know a little bit more things than I, than I did, did know in the past, even though I was a queen freak, you know, about the record label and how they didn't want to put out Bohemian Rhapsody. And they said, you know, all the struggles that they went through, but they remained with their vision and they remained who they were. And now look, I mean, they're the most biggest band and one of the biggest bands in the world. Yeah. They've had, they've had Broadway shows, they've had, you know, they've had all the, all, all the and quite rightly so, mm. to celebrate, if, if nothing else, to me, to celebrate the, the, the beauty of, of, of originality and imagination and, and, and fearlessness in, in creating, in creativity. Exactly. And creating from yeah. where you are rather than you know, relying on your computer, just like back in the day, yes, you know, exactly. with anything. No, they weren't just their instruments, mm -hmm. you know, and, the, and, and their imagination and the piece of paper, write some lyrics, pick up the instrument. You know, I have to force myself these days to get off the computer and pick up the instrument again. You know, it's like, especially because, especially of last year with like doing everything locked down and doing stuff, virtual things and, um, you know, writing on the computer. I, I loved, I was so good at, at having a, like an eight track tape player and doing everything more analog, you know, and, and it's taken me like last year uh, was the first time I really kind of started to get a handle on digital recording because I always had, I don't use Pro Tools, but I have, I use Logic and I've had it for years, but I always could just put a bass track down if I did a remote track for somebody and that's about it. I didn't know how to mix, I didn't know how to do anything special on it. In fact, I didn't like it because I put it up and I'd be like, oh, I don't want to look at this <laughs> virtual crap, you know, I just want to, you know, just want to record. And um, so it's like now it's like I, I last year when, when soon as all work kind of finished and tours all ended, I, I took a course in Logic, a 12 week course. So I said, let me see if I can actually learn really what's going on on this screen, how this stuff works and how, like, you know, but the digital recording process is really kind of cumbersome and involved, like it, you can get so sucked into it. And that's why now suddenly I'm finding, I'm always trying to learn something new on the computer instead of learning something new on my, you know what I mean? It's like the last thought is, okay, I've got everything working here. This is going to record and I can do this. I can put this effect on it. I can move. Okay. Now I'll play, you know, it's like, it's, it used to be the other way around. I'd sit for hours with my instrument, I'd get an idea, and then I'd hit record, play, and put it on the tape, and it'd just be done. You know, I wasn't looking at a screen or, you know, you just kind of go and do it. So it's kind of a weird time. You know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to balance myself out and kind of get back to a bit more of an organic way of working, but it's very difficult. Mm. It's really difficult because just the whole industry has pushed itself into that direction yeah well uh, going back to your like songwriting your, your three previous albums mm -hmm. um i had i used to be which is brilliant mm -hmm. again so melodic in america da, da, da. i love that one yeah. um but yeah, yeah i actually lent to a guitarist friend of mine years ago and i've never seen it back since i, I just managed oh no. i know i i have to send you another copy yeah. <laughs> i just managed to rip that picture <laughs> out for my picture but like Anyway, I've, oh. I've gone on a mad tangent. Hang on, where was I? Uh, yeah. So Back to songwriting. Yeah, when it comes to songwriting, um, just when you, the stuff you were saying about the digital, getting stuck in that digital hole, I, I have some mm -hmm. experience with this myself. When, when me and my partner will rewrite songs together and we'll just do it like acoustically. Me and I tend to be on the piano or whatever mm -hmm. and we'll do it that way. Sure. But then when we're trying to like, let the other band members know what we're doing we'll send it to them but we we want to send it just as we've written it right like just the guitar piano right, right. because you don't right. want to color their view of what they want to do on their instrument exactly i find exactly where but yeah. but it's had the opposite effect one drummer i sent the music to it was like oh yeah i don't know if i want to be doing that acoustic stuff and i'm like yeah but it's actually going to be a funk rock thing that's just how we wrote it but it's not going to be like that when we're jamming. Right, right, but he right, couldn't see it. Right, right. So then the guitarist did a whole digital logic, all the plugins, all the instruments himself. Right, right, sent right, right. that. And then that drummer was like, I don't want to be in the band because now he's telling me what to play. And I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> 
Oh, drummers. <laughs> drummers, drummers. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's, there's a point to that. It's like that it's, it's, um, yeah, sometimes people without either, either people really want to hear stuff finished with all the bells and whistles because they can't. Or they believe that they can't use their imagination to figure out the part they need to be told or they, that they think it has to have a, a direction. But yeah, I mean, what you just said there of, of recording something acoustically, just the way as, as it's written, that's the way most songs were written back in the day, all the, a lot of great songs. And then, then collaboratively, you get together with the other musicians and everybody has an idea and then it grows and grows and grows and grows until it solidifies, you know. But yeah, it's um, drummers are a whole nother breed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's... I love them, but you know, I've been lucky. I've been worked with some great drummers, so I've been very lucky. I only had a few that have been challenging. Yeah. <laughs> most times, I've you know, a good drummer to me just means I don't even recognize them. Yeah. I don't realize they're there. To me, that's the sign of a good. You know, like I just get I. I, I go where I'm going, and then I, when I realize that I'm just sort of sitting in that in that in that chair with them, I'm fine. Like I don't, I'm not, I'm comfortable, and and nothing is, uh, you know, that's to me a sign of a good drummer. Just yeah, absolutely. Is there where where is there where when I'm there? Yeah. You know, and and I'm not even you know I don't even have to think for one second that that I'm gonna like the chair that you know the seat's gonna get pulled out from under me. <laughs> Um, but when we were discussing about like how music was made years ago back in the 70s or whatever and then mm -hmm. nowadays it's kind of like mm -hmm. maybe that's there's an element of that what's happening you know a lot of songs because everyone mm -hmm. can now like record a whole song with all these instruments just added and that it's kind of like yeah. once it's sent to the other players like that it's kind of taken away their voice and taken away their creativity but it's so much better yeah. I find and I, that's why I was like that's why I've gotten a new drummer because I'm like, but come on now, have imagination. We're this is just yeah. the bare bones, but we want your muscle and we want your sinews of sure. music quality to come through because it's a collaborative thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's exactly. I I think that like home recording, as brilliant as it is, can somewhat take away from that. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's been the hardest thing of, of this whole um, pandemic and everything, too, is like, it's just missing that connection in a room with people playing music, because it's hard to, to, you can't recreate that on the screen, you can't, mm -hmm. I mean, you can, technically you can, but there's a, what all the things I've been seeing over the last year, all the different streams and the ones where there's everybody played at the same time and they're in a different square or whatever, it's amazing, but it's not the same. It, 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 it's just not. And you cannot recreate that without being in that collaborative bubble of physically in a space, in the room, amps going, whatever, you know, and, and, and creating something from that perspective is, is the, to me that's the ultimate that's what we do this for i think i mean you know no one wants to be a musician in a vacuum and just all by yourself in a bedroom and you know some people it's great when you can play a lot of instruments or you can write i enjoy composing stuff uh on the on the on, in logic or whatever and it's it's all my own in fact on, on my patreon page i'm doing um once a month i do a cover tune um for the subscribers and i i pick an artist at the beginning of the month and I say, like, for, that, for example, this month it's the Bee Gees. And I've already done Paul Williams and Sarah McLaughlin. And last month was uh, Neil Young. So I've gone with all these really different kind of artists. And then, I, then the, the subscribers vote for what song they might like to hear me cover by that particular artist. And then whatever song gets the most votes, I've got to figure it out. <laughs> how, the, how my version of it, you know. And I do those all by myself. Which is kind of fun, but it's not, you know, it's not what I would, I'm not, I don't want to work that way at, at all, really. Um, you know, I would love to be able to just be working with musicians in a space, collaborating and feeling everybody's energy. Because mm. it's, that's what it is. That's, that's, the, that's exactly what, what it is about and in every way. 
And uh, I hope that, um, you know, because we've all been kind of confined for this last year, I don't want, I hope that people don't get too used to that. You know, it beca because it's easy to, we're creatures of habit and, you know, we can easily, you know, human beings get into their own, you know, we get into a zone and it becomes the normal thing. But I, I think it, it would be such a shame to, to not be able to go back to that vibe spirit. And I know people are dying to go back to concerts and, and, and get, and, and I know I'm dying to get out and play them. So it'll be back, but, but it's, I, I sometimes I'm a little like I get worried, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, because, mainly because the technical industry, the technical side of the industry, are always kind of making it so like, oh wow, look what we can do now. We can mm -hmm. we can make these zooms. We can do that, you know, like they're like trying to make money. You know, we're trying to make art. It's two different things. So you must be missing your uh, Lenny Kravitz yeah. family then. That would be your main gig at the yeah, moment. Yeah, I do. One of it, well, I saw uh, the trumpet player who was with us for a very long time. He only left at the very, uh, just before um, all this stopped because he went to do a TV show here in France. Uh, Ludovic Louis is, is French. He's from, he's from Le Havre, Le Havre, <laughs> here uh, just outside of Paris. And... Um, so he's he came by the other day. I had I saw I got to see him, which was nice. And he's just done a solo album, which is beautiful. I'm gonna have him play some trumpet as well on my on my new stuff that I'm working on. Okay. Um, so, but everybody else, yeah, I miss them. I miss them. We we talked a little bit on the phone. And we we're all spread out because most of them is like half of them are in L.A. Lenny's in the Bahamas. I don't know where he is now. I think he's doing a movie somewhere. Mm. I think he's going to be um, be an actor now. Probably, <laughs> it's going to be a while before I imagine he hits the road again. Mm -hmm. And really, for me now, it's like I'm. It's it's a hundred percent me going on my solo stuff again now. I mean, you know, I'm not. I'm, I'm. You know, let's be honest. I'm not at the very beginning of my career anymore. I'm not at the end of it by any means. But I'm. But if I don't do things I really want to do now, when am I ever going to do them? So, and I. It's been way too long since I made that album that you have there. Yeah. So, this is my focus for now this year. You know, last year was just kind of finding my feet and figuring out what the hell's going on, like everybody mm -hmm. else. And now this year, it's like okay, things are moving into getting better or back to normal, whatever that means. And now it's my focus is to work on some new material. So that's why I'm here. My, my friends graciously let me use this space while I'm here in Paris. And so I come in every day, like a work, like, you know, 10 to 6 and, and, and start working on some new material. And then also doing my Patreon stuff, which has been kind of fun. Yeah. So tell us about it's the Patreon. Uh, it is a, um, it's a subscriber service. It kind of works like, um, like a Netflix or something, I guess you could say. Uh, it's um, um, patreon.com. Uh, artists, not just musicians, but writers, uh, filmmakers, anybody creating some kind of a project can, can start a campaign. They can start a page. Mm -hmm. P-A-T-R-E-O-N, it's spelled. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, different people have different ways they set it up. There's usually tiers, like my, I have three tiers. For example, the cheapest amount for one month for four dollars, four U.S. dollars a month, is the lowest tier, and then there's an eight dollar tier, and then there's a twelve dollar tier. And for the for for the four dollars, I get a I do a live chat with everyone who subscribed once a month. So we, we usually get on there for two or three hours and just, you know ask questions, we talk about whatever. Uh, then I do. Um, exclusives like some old demos of songs that were that I did on albums or something or I've, I'm, I'm putting together some photographs and things from sessions and things that were no, things that were never seen before stuff that I have in my archives um, also the things that are shared on patreon are not allowed to be shared in theory on Instagram or fate look so whatever's going on there is the only place you're gonna see it the stuff that I that I um, put up on there so that's that's kind of the basic um uh, subscription and if when it goes up to eight dollars a month i do it the the subscribers get a bass hang it's called down the basement and i call it that because that's what i used to go with my my where my music was my my old my my brother's old hi-fi and my amp 
amps and my guitars and the, the band rehearsal and my and my mother would say, where are you going? I go, down the basement. I'm going to go down and play some music, you know. So I call it down the basement, but I say basement with B-A-S. That's like a play on words. And that's also a second live stream that I do once a month for bass players. And we get a set up my bass and, and I play some different music when, when, when YouTube will allow it to go through because of the copyright stuff. You know, I play snippets of bass parts and we just talk about bass. Because I explain to them, I, I'm not a teacher. I can't teach technical things. And I know that there's plenty of things on YouTube that you can go if you want to learn scales and theory and things. I, I, don't, I don't know how to teach that because I never learned it really. So, but I just share my experience. I want to hear other bass players' experiences. I want to, you know, they ask me questions. If there's something I can help them with technically, I will. And also... Um, uh, they, uh, you know, I do, yeah, I do the sort of bass hang, and then they get the live chat as well. And then for twelve, then for twelve dollars, you get what I call the creative bridge mission. That's what that's the that's the thing that just keeps me thinking of something new is that cover tune. So you get all the res, you get the bass hang, you get the exclusives, you get the chat, and then for twelve bucks, you get a song every month. You get a, a cover tune of. Um, of whatever the artist I choose and whatever song I end up doing. So so I spend a week, you know, working on a song and, and learning learning the computer a little more and just kind of, you know, trying to do a, a cover of, of a different song. Which So by the end of the year, if this keeps going, there'll be an album of covers, <laughs> <laughs> at least. But I have to say, it takes a lot of time, and I have been explaining to some of the subscribers, and they've been very gracious because they're like, well, we, we definitely do want to hear your own record. So... So I, I'm starting to work on that actually this month more because I just started Patreon in February. So this is only the fourth month mm. and um, I need to get to work on my other stuff now. It's just taken a while to kind of get my rhythm with all of it because it's a lot of stuff. I do a newsletter also twice, twice a month. I do a newsletter that I write by hand. Oh. And I scan it so it's on a piece of so you, it's it's my handwriting and it's it's called the stream of consciousness newsletter because it's like whatever's in my head it's kind of like <laughs> so sometimes it's personal sometimes it's fact you know just I you know updates it can be many things yeah it's fun I enjoy it I really enjoy the people who have been subscribing and and uh, their energy and you know a lot of Bowie fans of course and. People from all across the board, people from New Zealand and uh, Israel, and it's just really, really nice. Well, it's nice to get It's there. great. It's a great way of, um, well, not only keeping you, you know, paid, but... A little, little money coming in, yeah, it's very helpful. I appreciate yeah, it very much. But it's so. also very helpful, like, keeping your creative juices flowing and keeping you motivated, because... Exactly. Exactly. Because that's where I was sort of, like, falling into that hole of depression, you know, I'm like, whoa. I'm not playing. I'm like, something's, ah, it's like I've lost a limb, you know, it's like I, I'm not myself. But, you know, um, yeah, it's been very helpful to just keep me, keep me uh, feeling like I got something, you know, I got some things to do, you know, it's really fun. It's really fun. And also the encouragement that comes back from them. It's really, it's, it's been some really nice people that have signed up and I, you know, I really enjoyed the live chats and things and getting to see everybody, get to know everybody, kind of, yeah. they get to know each other. They're like sharing information with each other. We're talking about music, sharing songs, you know, I'm some, some of the newer music I'm not familiar with and other people suggest things. So I love that. I like to be, you know, I like to know what people are listening to and what, and what they can, uh, what we can share with each other. That's great. Well, then everyone, Get on to Patreon and check out Gail and Dorsey and sign up yes. for all that stuff. Yes, please do. And it's, uh, yeah, it's Patreon slash Gail and Dorsey. That's it. You'd find me there. Perfect. All right. Uh, well, I want to know back uh, after you dropped out of college and you decided you wanted to be full time, you wanted to pursue music full time properly. Mm -hmm. You, mm -hmm. was it then straight away you moved to London or did you hang around Philadelphia first? Well, I was in New York before that. I kind of I dropped out of school in California. I was going to film school in L.A. And then I went to um, New York for like a year. And that's where I was like, OK, I'm going to go. I want to do music now. And I was doing demos on a four track recorder 
and taking my little demo songs all over. But I was just not getting any luck, you know. I was having a really rough time. And I was working with a, a friend of mine from school who was from London. He was a keyboard player. So we were kind of writing stuff together and we were sharing a flat and everything together. And eventually he had to go back to London because his visa had run out or whatever. And I was like, well, maybe if I go back with you and take some of these songs to London, maybe something will happen. And that's kind of how it started, you know. And, I, and he was like, yeah. And, and I went back and I lived in his family's house for a while. They were really sweet. They're like, they're my English family. They're still, well, mom and dad have passed away, unfortunately, but, but I'm still very close to that, their family. And uh, so that's how it kind of got, how I got to London, how, how that kind of started, because I did get there and I feel like I arrived right place at the right time. Sometimes it's timing, you know. Uh, in, in New York, I was like, you know, my stuff was a little bit, uh, at the time it was kind of, I think I was falling into that U.S. trap of, of black artists has to do black music. Mm -hmm. It just was just the way it was. Uh, and, and my stuff didn't, like, whatever I looked like or whatever didn't seem to suit, like, you know, people were like, yeah, but, like, eh, it's not, you know, it's not R&B. It's like, isn't that what you're supposed to be doing? But when I got to London, I realized that that didn't, that sort of um, categorizing didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And I was amazed because it was my first experience outside of the U.S. and my first experience in London and, and I saw all these different musicians who were black, white, whatever, making all kinds of music. It didn't matter. Like, if, if the song was a good song and it was a pop hit or whatever, it could be anybody playing it. It didn't matter whether they were black or white. It could be. In, it, so, so I was immediately kind of inspired by that. And then when I started to take some of my music around, you know, people were more responsive. They were like, oh, this is cool, you know, or, Let's make a demo of that, or I can. I know some musicians. Let's go because you know it's, it was like things were possible, and there was no sort of already shutting down, saying, "Well, this is I don't understand where this fits because you're not. It doesn't. You know, you don't look the part that would sing this or play this." Or. Mm. So that's kind of how I ended up in London, and, and how things kind of took off for me there. It's just um, I was lucky, mm. very very lucky. I feel very fortunate. Yeah, I, 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 when I moved to London ten years ago, I, I've, I noticed something like that too as well. And all like I've played all kinds of music, like it, which it, it totally yeah, blew yeah, my yeah. mind, because being from Ireland, Ireland's great and all, but it can be a little bit. There's a little bit of pigeonhole going on, and there's also there's a little bit. Well, it was back when I was younger, not so much now, but there was a bit of a hesitancy, mm -hmm. like all right, about being a woman musician. You know what I mean? Especially, oh, absolutely. especially playing a man's absolutely. instrument or whatever. So there was a bit of that. Exactly. Like even going into a guitar shop, people be like, oh, are you buying these for your boyfriend? What, what guitar strings does your oh, boyfriend use? Oh, that's classic, news? isn't it? I know, right? Yeah, oh, I love that one. <laughs> or, or God bless you, carrying your boyfriend's yeah. amp or, or you know, all this crack. Yeah, and yeah, I'm like, exactly. my amp, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. But when I moved to London, that uh, was uh, that didn't seem to be an issue nearly as much, right. you know. No. So no. yeah, exactly. Yeah, but Ireland has some great musicians. I have to say, oh, yeah. you know, Ireland is known for some of the greatest musicians ever. And I'm, like Jerry Leonard, who I worked with in Bowie for so long, who's a great, great, great guitar player. My goodness, Absolutely. just did some things with Jerry. We we've done some. Um, I don't know if I. I I don't know if I'm supposed to announce this, but I think I think it's okay. Is that uh, at some point the RTE mm -hmm. is it called yeah. the uh, it, it is this RTE Symphony yes. has is going to be doing a Bowie um, concert. It'll be virtual. Oh. Um, we were supposed to do it live, and we might we do it next year now, but uh, we were supposed to do it last year live um, in Dublin. Um, members of the Bowie band, myself, like the rhythm, you know, the sort of band, um, were going to, we kind of coming to Dublin, the symphony was going to play with us, and we would have guest singers doing David's songs, doing Bowie songs, um, and then COVID happened, and so they decided they wanted to keep doing it, so we actually, I did some recording with Jerry and Sterling, and uh, I think some other people have come in, like we all did different sessions at different times, but um, 
for we, we've done the backing tracks and then the symphony have done their parts and I guess they're going to put it out virtually at some point because we filmed ourselves recording it in the studio and then there's guest singers like um, Rufus Wainwright and, and uh, there's some Irish singers Amelda mm -hmm. May Brilliant. Um, um, Suzanne Vega Joe Elliott again I think he's doing Heroes mm -hmm. Um, so that, I'm not sure when they're going to broadcast that or how they're going to broadcast it. will be some kind of a stream, but, but that's in the works. Uh, I'm not sure if I was meant to announce it, but I don't know. I, should, I didn't ask Jerry, but I thought about it because we were talking about musicians from Ireland and I had just played with Jerry, which was really nice to work with him. Again. Yeah, that's it. I mean, well, when it comes out, I'll let you know when... I'm sure Jerry will let you know. Actually, why am I saying I'll let you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Well, I guess, Yeah. I guess I'm not sure when they. I think. I think he's still doing stuff. He's still doing tracks in New York. I think they, they keep adding. Every time one of these Bowie things started, we did one at the beginning of the year with Mike Garson. Um, every, like people keep wanting to join in, so we keep adding more songs to it. It's like another singer says, "Well, I want to sing one of those." I, really, I mean, you know, it's Bowie. Yeah. It's, it's very exciting, you know. <laughs> Um, I I don't like to do too much. I get very sad sometimes. It's very it was very you know it's kind of sentimental for me. So I don't I don't like to do too much Bowie stuff all the time. You know, um, but uh, when it's a nice vibe and nice people and I love I love orchestras. Mm. So I was like I can't turn this down. I just the idea of being able to hear string arrangements and stuff with all the songs. It's just really beautiful. They've done. I've I've heard some of the arrangements already. They're beautiful. Yeah. Well, I'm sure next year you'll get the opportunity to do it live. I'll definitely come. Yeah. I think it's it's supposed to be booked for like next April or something, or next May, like a year from now. We it should. I I had an email recently. I think that was was it. But who knows where we'll be by then? But I was like, I'm in. If, if, it, if, it, if it works, it works. Oh yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. Definitely. Like sure. Stuff's yeah. already opening up for the end of the summer. I just got an email from my oh, musical sure. director in a West End show. I mean, saying, "Yeah, we're back. Here's some new music. Get learning." Awesome. Like, yes. Awesome. You know. Oh, great. Good for yeah. you. Wonderful. Wonderful. It's all happening. Um, so once you moved to London, though, you're only like you're only 22. Was that not a bit scary? Just going over there with your mate and. I was, you know, when it came to music at that point, I don't know if I'd be quite as courageous as now, but I, that, I had nothing to lose, I felt. I was like, well, I, what have I got to lose? You know, I, I can only, all it, the worst is, is that I go back to New York or I go back to Philly or whatever, and I, I try something else. I just felt like I had nothing to lose. And I felt really comfortable with my, my friend Pete and his family were really, really kind. They really were like my English family. I had like a whole new family they they really welcomed me in and and then eventually i got my own you know i found my own friends in my own sort of space and, mm -hmm. and i i was in north london at first and then i moved to south london and i lived in pretty much in brixton area for most of my mm -hmm. time there um but i i i was just i i, I was determined you know i try and think back you now what was i thinking what you know i would i don't know if i'd be quite as brave these days <laughs> But I, I just, whatever I had to do to make music and, and get my, like, I, I always wanted to just see my own record go around on the turntable, mm. you know, and then once that happened, I was like, you know, now what's my next goal? Like, it's like, you know, I just sort of want to keep going. You know? Yeah. I just, I was just fearless at that point, and I felt I had nothing to, I had nothing to lose and everything to gain, basically. Yeah. So then, like, your, so then your albums come out. It's going doing really well, and then you get yourself a TV slot on the tube, and you're just there playing, just singing and playing on your own, playing bass, and then that's just. Yeah, well, that's how that's how I got my record deal. Actually, oh. that was you know I was um doing some um I was doing demos. I had a I had a manager at the time who was trying to help me get a record deal and help me make these little videos to kind of give to record labels and stuff because I had done. The song Wasted Country had been written and I had done demos of it already before it became the song on the actual album. And uh, I, my, you know, a friend of a friend knew somebody with this thing, this slot on the tube with, with Jules Holland and, and Paula Yates. And um, my manager was like, I can get you this slot on the tube. They're doing this thing every week now where they're going to feature an instrument. 
like one week it was harmonica, one week it was keyboards. One, like they, it was like a sort of little little feature they were going to put each week on this show. And the Tube at the time was the biggest music show in the UK. It was national and it was live from Newcastle, I believe. Mm -hmm. So I remember we had to take the train up and it went out at five o'clock on a Friday. I mean, like prime, like a sort of prime thing. And anybody who was anybody was like on this show. So I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. And they were like, it's bass week. So this week they're going to feature the bass. And so they want you to be on. And I was thinking, what am I going to do in the bass? You know, I'm not Mark King from level 42. Like I didn't have, I didn't think of myself as a bass player that could go on the tube and do something really like amazing on the bass, you know, for, for three minutes or whatever it was that you, you got. So I thought, I'm going to have to sing and play. That's the only way I can do, I do a bass thing where I sing and play. And then I thought, what can I sing and play that shows the ability of the bass to actually stand alone even as it's a, as a, as a accompaniment. It's not just part of the rhythm section or the thing that you can't hear, you know, <laughs> it's the bass and the voice can work just like the bass, and the, like a guitar or a piano. So I, I remembered um, the shock of the, the I didn't even know it was Bobby Womack's song. I don't think I didn't realize it until at the time. I remembered the Rufus and Shaka Khan version of Stop On By, which was a song written by Bobby Womack. And I used to play it. It was just one of those fun songs I used to play it, to practice to. And I was like, I'll do that because I can kind of sing that and play it. And you can still get the whole feel of the song by just hearing that bass line and, and putting the melody on top. So that was just my my quick thinking of like, what am I going to do on the two? You're welcome. Stop on by. One day, one day, one day, one day. I might be the one that makes you cry. And then that was the moment when I got up there and I did that song. It was that, like, the following week was when the, finally I was going to get a record deal. Like, I had been going to record, all the record labels, were, because that's where they looked for talent as well on that show. They had introduced a lot of young bands and things on the two. And uh, when, um, like, I was told at the time, and I think it was true, like, the industry always looked at the tube on a Friday, you know, with all the record labels to see what, you know, what young bands could, they might be into. So that's when they saw me, and then the Warner Brothers called, and then Ireland called, and then, so that's how, I, that's how I got my record deal, was being on that show, which was just out of nowhere, you know, friend of a friend, somebody knew, they pulled some strings, but however, I don't even remember the, the, the entire thread, but I know it was the manager I had at the time who, who knew somebody who knew somebody who <laughs> got me that slot. So it was, again, it was right place at the right time. And um, so I, I ended up going with Warner Brothers and, and doing Corporate World, my first CD, my first album, 1988. And did you, did you get to tour much with your own music? A little bit, yeah. I toured with that album in 88 and 89. I toured in Europe. And in, in the States, I did um, like radio pro promotional kind of tour, just me and my guitar player. So we would just take two acoustic guitars and we went around to the radio stations and the, the different Warner Brothers record labels in the U.S. They paid for this like little tour. But in, in um, I toured in the U.K., I uh, toured in Europe, just like a van tour. You know, I never had a bus or anything, but I had a really good band and we did, we sold out. The Ancien Belgique, we sold out the Grosse Freiheit. It was amazing. I, the Paradiso in Amsterdam, we played. Uh, we played in London. We played around Manchester, Newcastle. I don't remember the names of the venues. Mostly like large clubs, mm. kind of, kind of larger, kind of club dates, yeah. uh, or maybe a small theater kind of thing. But most of at the time, my wasted country, and I had a lot of good press you know the record didn't sell that great but I had a really it had a really good um, reception I had really good reviews and um, and I didn't do too bad I think I sold like a hundred thousand copies which is not a million but for a first uh, record in the UK that's why I, I sold in the UK so it did pretty good that's great and then when did uh, the session work start to happen that 
was always happening, kind of in at the same time. Um, it had happened before I had the record deal. I had, um, I had gotten, um, I'd met some musicians in London and was working. I got my first session I ever did was um, first recording session was a, a solo album for Boy George, the um, his first solo album outside of Culture Club. He did, and I don't know. I think I played him like three or four songs and. I don't know if they even made it on the record because, as, as you probably know, sometimes you do a record, it doesn't mean that those songs that you on will end up on the record mm -hmm. because people record a lot of different songs and they figure it out uh, later sometimes what works and what doesn't work. Um, yeah, I had met, um, you know, I was had been playing around in the pubs. I had met some people, I met some women that had these little jazz groups in the pubs and that was like the first thing I was doing to make a little extra cash. And then I was working on my own songs at the same time. And through that, I met um, a drummer. Um, I met, I don't even know, I'm trying to remember how I met John Stevens now. John Stevens was a, uh, a jazz drummer who's since passed away. He's, he's quite like an avant-garde, avant I don't know what you call it, like a sort of, sort of avant-garde drummer really in a way like not not like bebop jazz but sort of more sort of experimental like fusion and he was yeah fusion -y. uh he was an old kind of an older guy at the time and he was best friends or really good friends with charlie watts from the rolling stones because they were kind of i guess around the same age and and also unbeknownst to me charlie watts was like a jazz freak i had i would never i just knew him as charlie watts like most people in the rolling stones and I was like, what? And John said, oh, no, Charlie is like, he always wanted to play jazz. And he just ended up in the Rolling Stones. Well, <laughs> he can play whatever he wants, you know. He's a great drummer uh, in the Rolling Stones. I mean, come on. Uh, that's another one of my favorite bands. But um, so John, um, John uh, uh, introduced me to his son. He had a son. He has a son, uh, Richie Stevens. And Richie was also a drummer, but he was my age. Mm -hmm. And Richie was uh, was playing drums for Boy George, and he had a band. He was signed to Virgin with a with a singer, and they had a little funk band. Richie was a really great funk drummer. He still is, like soul R and B, like killer. And um, and John said, you know, you should because I was working with John in another context, his with Richie's father, uh, and I got to sing with the Charlie Watts Big Band because of that, because of, of the association with John. And then he said, you know, you should meet my son because he's in that pop world with you young people, you know, the stuff you're trying to do. I know you're doing your own stuff. And and so I met Richie and I, I started playing in Richie's band that was on Virgin with doing showcases. They had these showcases that they had to do. And then I got the session with Boy George through Richie because Richie was playing drums for George. Uh, and then that's kind of how the session thing started. And then from then once... Uh, I think Boy George was also on Virgin Records. And then Virgin had Donny Osmond and they had some other artists that I don't remember that didn't go on to be really famous. And they started hiring me to play for all these different artists on Virgin. Like after they saw me with Richie's band and then they saw I had worked on the Boy George and then they put me on Donny Osmond. And then I did some other artists that, like I said, they were new artists, but they didn't kind of take off, I don't remember all their different names. There's a couple of singers, a couple of male singers, like soul singers. And um, so I kind of got into the session thing through through that. And, um, and then my own thing took off, but I always kind of had a little foot still in that pond, you know, like in that water. Like I just, because I like playing everything, you know. Uh, that's my problem. I think I, I, not a problem, but it's um, it's certainly something that, makes it hard for me to make loads of records on my own of my own because I get I you know work comes and you know I don't even like to call it work it's like blessings come and it's like oh, no, no, I want to do that I want to play that I want to play everything I like all kinds of music I like it all and especially you know something that I'm not used to playing you know comes along and it's like now it's a chance to grow in that area like to, to, to see what I can do you know sometimes maybe I you know, I might do better in one style than another, but I just love the challenge. 
and I listen to so many different things that I just don't want to turn anything down. I enjoy it. I love the, I love getting a new assignment. So that's kind of how like the session thing just has always been there. Um, and then when when my own th experiences with record labels, because it wasn't that I didn't want to make my own records, but I just didn't like the whole record industry at the time and the whole the whole you know, the singles and the this and the that. And in, in some ways, I was kind of happy when people started making their own records. When Ani DeFranco came around, my goodness, she was the very, she was like the pioneer. It's like, take care of your, you know, control your own shit. You do your own thing. It's your label. It's your, no one's there to tell you what to do. And she's had an incredible career. But I, um, you know, I just uh, didn't want to you know, I didn't want to have to deal with all that, all the scrutiny of the thing of fitting into this. It's like one, they tell you they love you once and then you give them music and then it's like, then they want to change it all. So I just couldn't understand that. And I, you know, I'm not the most um, uh, aggressive person. Like I'm not a, you know, I'm not a real, you know, I'm like, you know what? I don't want to, I just, I'll do something else that, that's, that's fulfilling. So I, I just kind of, dropped out of that whole thing of, I didn't really care about having a record deal. And if I was going to do a record, like, and probably even now, I'll put it out myself, like the last one. Because it's, you know, I want to just enjoy the experience. I don't need all the other stuff, you know. I just want to make a beautiful piece of music that I can share with the world or with people who want to listen to it. Um, so I keep, so the session thing just became more prominent. I just thought, well, I'll just keep, and it, and work kept coming, you know, blessings, the phone would ring and there would be some, one thing would lead to another and one artist would see, see me with someone and then they would want, they would say, oh, that would be cool. And, you know, so I, I, I kept getting the calls and I just loved it. I just loved going from, you know, from Zuccaro to Gwen Stefani to, to, you know, like the, the most different <laughs> Not, you know, environments and tight styles of music that you can imagine. It's just, it was just too much fun. Oh, absolutely. It was too much fun. So I, so I, I stayed in that, in that world and I still enjoy it. Yeah. But then, but then like the biggest, arguably the biggest session gig of all time came knocking on your door. David Bowie, like, I mean, That's how did that come about? And what was that like? That was just out of, no it just came out of nowhere. <laughs> he just called me on the phone one day. I mean, now in retrospect, because I, I know a bit about the man, you know, that's how he worked. He would, if he, if he wanted to hire you, he would call you personally. And the most beautiful thing about him that I always thought was, I had huge respect. If he wanted to fire you or let you go, he would call you in person. And a lot of artists, that's the manager's job, mm -hmm. right? You know, I've seen it too many times when, you know, in the band and somebody gets the sack or somebody's not working out and it's like they suddenly just kind of get sent home and the artist doesn't want to have to deal with it, you know? Like, mm -hmm. sometimes they will say, I'm sorry, it's not working, whatever. But I, I, I you know, there were a few times we had some different, in, you know, different kind of um, incarnations of the band or some project we were doing and he would have someone sing or do something and it just didn't work, but... It wasn't a horrible thing. It just sometimes things just don't fit, and it's not because the person is, is bad or good. It's just they don't fit with with the vision of of what's happening, or the or they're not, you know, what they can offer is not going to make the thing what he wants it to be or she wants it to be. Mm -hmm. But he would always, you know, call you personally, and I just thought that was really, really I had that's really respectful, mm -hmm. you know, to, and explain to you why, you know, not not just you know. So, um, but uh, he called me, I was working at Tears for Fears at the time, and, um, which was a great band. That was one of the best bands I've ever been a part of. Um, and I was at Roland Orzabal's house when I got the call. I was working on a solo record. I was going to do another solo record that he was going to produce. So we were, I was just hanging out in Bath, writing songs at Roland's house, getting up every day and going down to his studio and just sort of jamming and coming up with some songs, a couple of them that are on the, the I Used to Be album, um, uh, Be My Angel and um, Whether You Are The One, were two things that were, that were, that started with Rolling at that studio. <clears throat> and, and um, yeah, and we had just done a Tears For Fears tour, and we just done the Raul and the Kings of Spain album, and then I was just in writing mode, and uh, one day, 
the phone rang at the studio. He tra- tracked me down. He ca- I think he had called my manager and they said, well, she's in bed. She's not in New York. Blah, blah, blah. And he called the house and, um, and I thought someone was playing a joke on me, like one of my London friends. So I kept going, who is this? Who is it? Come on. Who's, what, this isn't funny. And he was like, no, love, it's, it's David. It's, which he must get all the time because I know he does call people like out of the blue mm. and then they're like, ah, we're freaking out as you would do. <laughs> And I had never met him before, and I I wasn't like a, you know, I wasn't a Bowie fanatic like I was for Queen. I loved his music. My favorite is is Young Americans. I like that was when I really discovered him as a singer. I just thought, God, this guy's voice is ridiculous. Mm. What an amazing sing that the singing on that album to me still to this day is some of the best singing I've ever heard on a record ever, mm. on that Young Americans album. Even though he would say, you know, he was like. He said, I'm glad you didn't know me at that time because he was a cokehead and he was doing you know, drugs and drinking and stuff. When I knew him, he was sober the whole time. So he said he wasn't maybe not a, quite a nice, as nice a person back then. But he sure could sing. <laughs> I don't know. Whatever drugs he was taking or whatever, it didn't, didn't interfere with his uh, ability to, to completely floor me on that album. Um, so I... I um, yeah, he called and I just, I ended up, uh, he said, I, I need you for six weeks for a Nine Inch Nails tour. He explained the whole thing on the phone. We're going to have these people in the band. And he's naming, he's naming guitarists and stuff who, who are on these Bowie albums that I've had from the 70s. I'm going, Carlos Alomar? Oh, Mike Garson? I'm like, I'm going to play with these people, like whose names I looked at as like a, you know, a teenager. I'm like reading their names. And, the, and I would be in the same band with these people was just blowing my mind. i never forget that phone conversation. I was like, oh my God, how can I live? Like, I really didn't think I was ready for it. I was scared. I was really, really scared. But I couldn't say no. I remember hanging up the phone. I said to Roland, I said, that was Bowie. It was really David Bowie, and he wants me for six weeks, and, and I we're in the middle of this, and he was like, it's Bowie, you got to go. Mm. I mean, he was like, you know, you just, <laughs> it's just one of those things you don't say no to, you know. And six weeks turned into many, many years. Yeah. Uh, many amazing years, so I'm grateful to him. I think uh, I owe him so much, and I think about him nearly every day, mm. especially every every good thing that continues to happen to me. I think a lot of it has come from my association with him and I and I and I know I know he knows I'm grateful. Yeah. I'm sure it's not just that for <laughs> friendship. The, the, you know, you guys you could see the friendship there, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um yeah. but um but being with Bowie for so long and playing through all that back catalog of so many different styles and then going on to play with so many you mentioned other artists there before like, you know, by George uh, Gwen Stefani, but there's also, you know, you played also with Seal, Lenny Kravitz, Indigo Girls, Brian Ferry, like so many yeah. different, so much variation yeah. in terms of music. I've, um, Absolutely. Like, is that, do you reckon that you got that work because you've been always been so open to all kinds of music and they're open to play all kinds of music? I think so, yeah. I think that's one reason. Um, it always helped that, to be a singing bass player, like we, we mentioned before. I think that was also a, a good... Um, feather in my cap or whatever you how you ever you put it you know like um it always was helpful because you know people get two for the kind of two for the price of what like you know it's an extra less one less hotel room or one that you know it's it's appealing in terms of the numbers you know of putting together a show um i think you know and i think it was you know in some ways the kind of jobs that I got, I think it would work to my advantage that I was female. You know, sometimes people think it's it's a disadvantage to be a female playing bass or playing drums or something. But I think it work, It can work to an advantage because, you know, whether you might want to think of it that way or not, it's kind of a novelty at that time. More like, a, like you know, so it's kind of a special thing for someone to have in their band because it's an, an extra kind of wow factor or something. Mm. So I think it that helped in some respect. But also because I, I just think that I was I was open to trying and to play anything. I was you know I wasn't a snob about one particular kind of music or or one you know I had no I had no um, uh, boundary or you know I had no um, barrier of to where you know I, I didn't have a 
a set thing that I wanted to be known for or do. I just wanted to, to experience as many uh, musical situations as possible, as many as possible, including my favorite, I have to say my favorite experience of all time was playing for Olivia Newton-John because that was my childhood, that was my real dream. Like, I, you know, <laughs> Bowie was not, something I imagined would ever happen. Like, but Olivia was something I dreamed would happen. You know, like, you know, it's like, Bowie was a surprise. So it's like, what? Cause I thought I'm not gonna be in, Bowie was like that tier where it's like being in, he was to me, one of those artists that's known like um, Frank Zappa or something. If you're in Zappa's band, you're like, it's like a, if you're in certain artists' band, like their bands are as infamous as they are, like as as, as you know, it's like I've been a part of the so and so band, and I and he to me that was Bowie was one of those people. It's like if you play with David Bowie, you you're in this other kind of thing, like you're you're on a level that's special or something. And I didn't ever think I would reach that, even with anything else I'd done. I just thought, well, that's not, I'm not going to be there. So that's why that was such a shock, mm. such a shock. And then I just worked my ass off in that. Like I was so nervous, I was so scared. Mm. And I have to say that Reeves Cabrels and, and Mike Garson, they really took me under there and Carlos Alomar. They, they were so kind because they, they could see this fright. I was, I think I was 32 when I got that gig, 31, 32. And I was just terrified to be with these guys, these big hit heavy hitters who've been on all these Bowie records already and done tours with him from Ziggy to, you know, the Glass Spider and all that. And it's like, wow, mm -hmm. I'm in this group. Now I'm in that group, you know? And he was so um, incredibly gracious. Like, I really, you know, I think I've said this before in other interviews, but it's absolutely true that he had an uncanny knack of I think one of Bowie's biggest talents was who he picked to play the particular songs that he was wanting to record or perform. He knew, and he used to say to me, the artist, he said, it's like casting a movie. If the, if the director um, gets just the right actors, his work is done. He's done. That's the, that's the job. That's the trick is finding exactly the right people. Then you sit back and you send them out to work. So you have to have this foresight of knowing what each person is capable of. And you've already seen them in the role. And then they just do what they do. You don't tell them what to do because you, he already can see what you do. And he knows that what you do is going to fit with what that person does. And, that, that, and then that, and that's going to create scary monsters or that's going to create you know, ashes to ashes. And he was so good at that. Mm. That was what his, to me, one of his biggest talents. And and something that I try and think about. And and he uh, he had, you know, I, I would, you know, like it's like when he asked me to do Under Pressure the first time, I was like, how am I going to do that? How am I going to sing that and play the bass, you know, and, and do the whole, you know, make it. And he was like, I give you two weeks. And he walks out of the room and I was like, so I had to figure it out. But he knew I could do that and I didn't. Mm -hmm. And he knew that in many, uh, at the beginning of my first few years working with him, the first couple of tours, he really, you know, he knew I could do things that I didn't know I could do. Mm -hmm. And he pushed me to do, he would just present them and go, just do that. And after a while I stopped doubting myself. Mm -hmm. And I, I so... I'm so grateful to him for that. You know, that's a that's a real mentor. That's a real teacher. You know, someone and someone who cares about seeing you be your fullest potential. Mm. And so, and he was like that with everybody. He was always encouraging to, for, for for all the, all the busy mus musicians to do what you do. Like, give it, go, bring bring what you bring. That's why you're here. And so he, he could see things in me that I couldn't see in myself, a lot of things that I never thought I would be able to play or, or accomplish with him and his music, especially some things like Teenage Wildlife, some songs that I hadn't heard of his that were kind of in those, you know, Joe the Lion, stuff on Heroes. 
I wasn't like a sort of Bowie fanatic, so I didn't know all those little songs that were on the albums. And some of them are really intricate. Mm. And his the way he writes a song and crafts a song and the parts and the key changes and the, it's just like what who writes music like this guy you know it's amazing and it's not you know China Girl yeah I know that one and you, you know you know the hits but then the first tour the first couple of tours we were doing some obscure stuff that I had never heard of and it was really challenging for me especially because I don't read so I had to learn it all in my head and all these different kind of parts and. And I would make my own little charts of, you know, to guide myself through some of the sort of parts. But it was such a great learning experience. You know, it was, it was the biggest challenge I think I, I've ever had. And, and he was with me all the way. It was, ne- it was never, never, he never had any doubt. So then you stop doubting yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like initially I'm doubting myself every step of the way. And then he's looking at me smiling like, Go. Go, girl, he would say. Just go, do it. <laughs> so uh, so I, I appreciate it. Well, that. you can even hear him say that on the, um, you know, on a, a, the reality tour in Dublin. And he's like, go, Gail. Oh, yeah, yes, he does. <laughs> yeah, he does do, yeah. He was always, no, he was really sweet. It's great to have that, though, because, like, when you were talking about the doubting yourself, that is such a bane of the musician and such a bane of the artist mm-hmm. that, inner critic that we all have saying I can't do this I'm not this absolutely. to have someone on the absolutely. outside saying look you can you know it's a, 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 a particularly mm-hmm. um, a great position to be in with such for, for any artist to actually be the one to absolutely. say look come on I believe in you you know what I mean absolutely absolutely you don't absolutely and, and also you know you know sometimes I don't know for me sometimes it was a little bit like okay you know you're a female musician, so you almost have this, even though no one's saying anything, it's like you almost have to do a little extra or you have to be a little a little more or something. I don't mm. know. You've got to prove yourself more or something because, you know, guys, you know, walk in and then they, they own the, you know, they're, they're, they're Jimmy Page and it's like whatever. But it's like women kind of aren't even allowed to do that almost. You know what I mean? So it's like you kind of... It's so it was really nice to have that sort of just know I had somebody had my back, you know, who was like, I you got this, you know, it's like there was no doubt. It's very helpful. It's so helpful. Yeah. And, and yeah, and even male, female, it's true. We do have our inner critics, you know, music is very, it's very personal mm. being a musician. And, it, and some people are more delicate than others. And some people don't have a big ego with it. And some people have, you know, we struggle with this kind of, the sensitivity of it and how 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 we how we how well we represent the music you know how well we how, how good we can be yeah. so it is always helpful to, to have encouragement always helpful. yeah also i mean you kind of touched on it there a little bit when when you're when we're talking about like being a female musician i think i've certainly found it myself that you you don't necessarily feel as confident Especially because, you know, when you're younger and you first start playing it and you do get all that, oh, you, you know, are you buying that for your fella or is this your brother's guitar mm-hmm. or um, yeah, yeah, girls yeah. can't really play? Or, you know, you just get this straight off the bat before you've opened your mouth and you've said it. Like I do, I'm a stand-up comedian as well. And so that's mm-hmm. another world so, where oh, you know, yeah, oh, women yeah, aren't yeah. funny. And I'm like, actually, you bastard, I am, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you so it's uh, yeah, already yeah. You, you you have to kind of t- grow a thicker skin and and you do have these wavering like yeah. dips of confidence um but yeah. it's but that's why i'm so blessed with this doing this podcast because i get to talk to my heroes and people like you who have inspired people like me and continue to inspire so from all female musicians i just want to say thank you gail oh uh, thank you ellen God bless. <laughs> I'm, I, it, and it's a wonderful feeling to feel that, you know, after, you know, it's like I, I've been doing this a long time now. I actually forget, you know, because it seems like all these things just happened yesterday. But this it's been many, it's been a few decades that I've been at this. Mm-hmm. And then when I, you know, when I have an opportunity to speak to someone like you and also seeing some of the people that are on my Patreon as well and, and you know, things that they've seen me in over the years or whatever, and it's like, wow. You know, I feel like I'm so happy that I've been able to inspire people because 
I wouldn't be here without the inspiration of all my heroes. I wouldn't be here without Nancy Wilson from Heart or Anna, Anna Nancy or, or John Deacon or Queen or Freddie or Bowie or any of those people. They gave me the fuel, you know, they gave me so much energy and passion and beauty in their music and what they've contributed to the world that that's the energy that I've needed to overcome anything I've needed to overcome. So I, if, if I can do that for somebody else, that's amazing. So I, I'm grateful. I, I'm, I'm humbled and I'm grateful for that. You know, and, I, and it makes you, makes me feel that, you know, whatever sacrifices that you make, because there's sometimes with touring and stuff for me, it's like, it's been a lot of things you can't do. You know, you miss weddings, you miss, funerals, you miss this, you miss birthdays, you miss things that I never had kids, you know, whatever, not that I really wanted to, but, you know, I couldn't have a dog, you know, things like, just little things that a lot of people take for granted in life that, that sometimes you think, oh, I should be doing these things. I'm like, no, I'm doing what I, what I do. This is what I'm here for. I'm here to make music. And, and so I, to, to get feedback from people like yourself and, or any other musicians who have been inspired even in a tiny way is so much it's like it brings me really great joy because it feels like okay none of this is in vain mm. you know i've i've been able to inspire someone and i hope that they they then inspire someone and we keep this going we have to keep music really as live as possible we have to keep it going we have to keep it growing we have to keep it creative we have to get it keep it from being stale we have to keep it has to you know this is a to me, music is like it's like water and air. It's, we need that. Mm. We really need that. And I don't think there's any other art form that is as as personal as music. None. Mm. Not you know. Yeah, maybe maybe reading, maybe literature. You know, like reading a poem or something. That, but but you know, a film doesn't do it. Like a, a, you can you can walk into you know, a person can be standing in there and all of a sudden you hear a violin that comes from a little piece of music from a symphony and it can reduce someone to tears, no matter what language they're from, no matter how old they are, no matter what country they come from. It, it's like there's nothing more immediate than that that emotional response that music brings in, than in any other art form. You know, you can look at a painting, people get critical. You know, it's like, you know, but like music can just go right in there and touch you, like right away. Whether it's a voice or something, and you don't even know why, you know, it don't even have to be musical or, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's such a beautiful, beautiful language and we just have to keep it thriving. We need, we need it. It's part of our existence. It's come from, you know, even the birds singing or like, you know, yeah. it comes from everywhere. Absolutely. You've kind of brought this interview full circle now by saying we need it because you wrote to me when I was in my early 20s, keep playing bass, we need you. And that's right. we've got a whole career out of it. So thank you so much. <laughs> wonderful, Ellen. I'm so happy to hear that. I am so happy to hear that. That is really wonderful. Oh, brilliant. Well, we're looking forward to when your new album comes out and we're all going to come check you out on Patreon and keep an eye on you on the socials. Wonderful. So wonderful. I will, uh, yeah, I will, I will, I'll have your email now. I'll stay in touch with you when my new album's ready. Maybe if, if you're still doing your podcast, we can uh, do a little special. Absolutely. I'm going to definitely try and have something done by the end of the year. For sure. Oh, definitely keep in touch. You got us. Oh, yeah. <laughs>